Okay, thank you, Carmen. Yeah, so I'm Mark Batney. I'm down in San Luis Obispo in Santa Barbara counties. Um, I was the viticulture advisor there from 2001 until 2018, last year. And now my title is Water Management and Biometeorology. But I still do quite a bit of work with grapes, an important crop down there. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, as Carmen said, evaluation of climatic water and soil factors for looking at vineyards. Uh, a bit of an outline of my talk here. Um, Climatic factors, the too cold, too hot, um, and some adaptation steps that people have taken in different parts of the world, um, limitations with that. Um, look at water factors, uh, quantity and quality of water. The quality of water is very important that we use for irrigation that's often overlooked, and that's, that's to our disadvantage. Um, and also impacts over time of using poor quality waters. And then finally look at soil factors, so limitations for growth related to those factors, and then Ideally, a lot of my focus is on what sites you want to avoid or what sites you want to be very careful with, uh, looking at problems that can occur over time. And then consider fundamental site capacity. And you know, part of this concept is things that you want to do before you spend all the time, effort, and money to put a vineyard at a site. Because once you do that, you're very limited in the changes that you can make. You can't just pick it up and move it. It's not a portable asset like an airplane or something. Once it's there, it's kind of there. Okay. So climatic factors, uh, this kind of repeats a little bit of what Glenn said, maybe a little from a little different angle though. Uh, seasonal heat accumulation or average temperature influences the varieties that we choose, the cultivars that we choose, and the types of production, whether you're growing wine grapes or table grapes or raisin grapes. There's quite a bit of leeway within these uh, basic ranges here. I mean, within California, we have different people growing different types of grapes in very similar climates, so we know that there's a lot of adaptability for the, the crop here. But there are some uh, basic limitations that we do need to keep in mind. Uh, winter cold damage can be a significant factor and a very big limiting factor for many areas. Uh, there's been a lot of optimists planting uh, vinifera cultivars in Nebraska, but Mother Nature puts a limit on you. you. You might do great in the summer, but then winter comes along and things just don't last. Uh, frost risk, I'll mostly talk about that in my next presentation, but that is a, definitely a factor that you do, do have to consider when you're thinking of where you want to put a vineyard. Um, heat damage, another issue that we're dealing with more and more as we have some of these heat spells in California and elsewhere, um, that definitely impacts a crop like, like wine grapes. Uh, wind, I'll show you some examples of how wind can damage things. Uh, some sites are just always going to be prone to very strong winds, and you need to keep that in mind if you're looking to grow there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, little bit about uh, influence of topography and, and location choice, and then some adaptation and adjustments here. Um, the tool that I use to do this type of site assessment as far as temperature conditions are little data loggers like this. This is a, a Hobo brand data logger, fairly inexpensive, about $55. It'll run for a year, collects measurements every 15 minutes. You can't ask for much more from a little tool like this. And then we just house it in what we call a radiation shield, that little uh, yield plate thing. Set that up about five feet off the ground, let it run for a year, and with that data then you can get a pretty good understanding of what your local climate is at a site. If you don't have access to any other climate data, any other information, this is a great way to start. And I often put these out with growers who are trying to answer the question of whether or not they can grow grapes on a property if they don't have any other information. So here's an example of how we use that. Uh, this is a map of San Luis Obispo County. The green and red areas, those are where we have irrigated crops, just to give you an idea of where the current farmland is. And a grower or a farm uh, land owner was curious, could they grow grapes in this area? So what we did, put out one of these data loggers. And this is what the, the measurements look like over a, a year. Uh, we're actually looking from April 1st right here up until um, October 31st here, so the entire growing season. So what we're looking at is uh, every 15 minutes, the data logger takes a reading. So you can see the accumulation of temperature here. And pretty you know, standard fluctuations, uh, daily max, daily mins. You see there's a heat spike here. I can't see that, it looks like maybe in uh, early September. A heat spike up to 110 degrees. So those are really good things to be able to measure with a data logger like this. But then with this 15-minute data here, we then do some processing. We calculate what's the average temperature over that entire uh, several-month period. In this case, 
Um, 63 degrees was the average for that entire period. And then we can also calculate the degree day accumulation. And that's this bar here. Now the, the software for the hobo does that automatically. You can just have it calculate the degree days and we en end up with 3,225 degree days there. So two different ways to assess the temperature conditions throughout that period from April through the end of October. Now with those two values, we can then plug those into our basic relationship charts here. So this is kind of like what Glenn showed you, just a little different way of, of looking at the data. So degree day accumulations, we can plug into this Winkler scale, like you have here on the left. And that just, it's, I know it's kind of hard to see with the small numbers there, but we, that breaks out then to be a region three between 3,3500 degree days and favorable for the production of, of wine grapes in that area. Or if we use a chart like on the right here, and I should point out that both of these came from a, a blog that Greg Jones had put up. Both these articles are available online, or both of these figures are from his blog. You can also plot the average temperature here, and that just happens to fall right on the uh, boundary between the, these two categories here. And you can then kind of look at the varieties that are overlapped by that average temperature of, of 63 degrees and get a feeling for what might work well there. So looks like based on this, something like um, uh, Merlot or Malbec might be a, a really good fit for a site like that. Okay? But like I said, these are not necessarily cut in stone. If for any one site like this, there really is a fair range of different things that will grow pretty well there. And there's some other ways that we can make um, the site more or less adaptable to uh, uh, a great variety or cultivar. So, you know, Glenn, I'm always going to be saying cultivar or variety too. So, so I, I mentioned when we put out these temperature sensors, typically they're put five feet off the ground. That's a standard height, sometimes six feet. Um, here's a really important factor, though. The height above the ground where you measure temperature will give you different values. It tends to be warmer closer to the ground during the day. So if we put a temperature sensor, say, one foot off the ground or two feet off the ground, and then calculate the degree days at a given site, we end up with a higher value. So that's what this chart is showing you. These are uh, degree day values measured at a single site, but at just different heights above the ground. So here at one foot, we are almost 3,800 degree days. You go up here, let's say, to six feet, and now you're something about a little over 3,500. So big difference. That may not sound like a very big difference, but that makes a big difference for ripening of, of grapes. And why that's important is because grapes are a very malleable crop. We can choose to grow them at a wide range of heights. Um, on the left, we have uh, a training system without any type of structure. These are just a free-formed vine, and the fruit is about six inches off the ground. So that's going to be very close to the heat generated during the day. That will enhance the ripening of that fruit. On the right, that's a, a high-wire system that's about six feet off the ground. And that is designed now to lift up the material far off the ground and put it into a cooler environment. So how that choice is now helping us determine what type of temperature conditions those vines are going to experience. And this is not something new. Um, this is, the question was asked earlier, you know, why do people train these vines very close to the ground? Typically the reason why that's done is so to enhance ripening. You would do that in an area if your temperatures are too cool and you have problems ripening fruit. A shorter height training will enhance the ripening. So this is what the French figured out. Back in the 40s, they were doing experiments like this, kind of back during World War II, I think. Those dedicated viticulturists were still doing research out in the field, which may kind of explain why they were drinking a gallon of wine a day to kind of just <laughs> get through that. But you know, that's what they determined, that lower cordon heights enhanced the reliability of ripening. So now if we go to visit France and decide that looks cool and copy it, come back to California, but not understanding why they did that, then we run the risk of creating problems for ourselves. Because in a hot area, if you plant very close to the ground like that, you are running serious risks of just burning up your fruit. So you have to understand why things were done to uh, really implement things correctly. Um, on the opposite scale, we have winter cold damage is always another concern in many areas. So the central coast, we, for the most part, have a pretty mild climate, but we can have some serious winter cold conditions. And this is an example of what can happen in a low-lying site like this. Now, this is where cold air accumulates in these valley bottoms like this. So this isn't really frost damage. This is middle of the winter when the vines are dormant cold damage. 
So those severe temperatures, especially in the early part of the winter when the vines have yet to fully harden off, you can suffer a lot of damage like this. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that when I discuss some of the, the frost-related issues as well. But this is clearly a limitation on production when you can't have vines survive. So temperature data, especially those same type of data loggers, but going through the winter, will give you a really good idea of what types of conditions you might experience and what your chance of survivability would be. Chances are the neighbors probably told these people, that's not going to be a, a good crop for that area. You know, this might be a better spot for pasture or something where you're not going to worry about things uh, dying off with the cold weather. Um, grapevines are also can be very sensitive in the flower clusters to temperature extremes. Both very cold temperatures can damage the flower clusters and very hot temperatures as well. This is an example of very hot temperatures. Uh, this, this is one of, of Glenn's um, um, very rare, um, I want to say Italian variety, I think, that, that probably evolved right next to the coast and did not like hot temperatures that basically burned off every single flower cluster um, in this vineyard block. So a lot of varieties would not be affected this severely, but it just is, goes to show that you know, these temperature extremes during flowering, that's the time when the vine is very, very sensitive to suffering some very considerable loss. So understanding what types of extremes your site might be susceptible to are going to be key, and especially with variety selection uh, like, like Glenn was talking about. Um, the other consideration is sunburn, and this ties in with what Larry Bedig was talking about with the trellis design, trying to design a system so that you're not going to be uh, subjecting the fruit to excessive heating. Uh, what we have happening in many of our hotter areas is this type of sunburn or um, impediment of ripening and coloring up, where you end up with sort of pinkish colored berries. They don't have the color or the flavor that you would like to have, and then some incipient raisining as well. So that, as we plant in, in hotter and hotter conditions, this is just something that we have to be aware of is going to be a limitation on our production. Uh, wind in a lot of our coastal hills especially can be quite a significant limiting factor. So this looks like two very, very different blocks, but in reality this is one single block. The vines at the bottom of the hill have shoots about five feet long, the vines at the top of the hill in the same block have shoots that maybe are about a foot long. So they've received the same amount of water, the same amount of fertilizer. The difference is the wind conditions. So this is in one of our hillside areas here where the higher up you go on this hillside, the more and more of this constant wind coming from the ocean is just beating against those vines. And they simply cannot grow under that type of, of impact. So if they had appreciated this beforehand, they would never have planted that upper part of these hills. Uh, that's sort of a, a live and learn type experience here, but that's part of the hope of now transmitting this information to you that hopefully you'll remember if you decide to plant on some beautiful hilltop here that that's where you put your tasting room with the beautiful views and not try to go grapes all the way up to the top because they simply, you, it, it's very hard to get them to grow in those windy conditions. What they are doing here, and you can kind of see it, that's what they have placed these um, fabrics up here to try to slow down some of that wind but still, it's, it's not, they're not able to do quite enough at this site just because of the direction of the wind coming straight at that block from the Pacific Ocean, which is just right out there. So there's not a whole lot of natural barrier to that flowing wind. I do have a question about that site. Oh, yeah. Well, this, this may be an example of, of just being bold, you know, and, and trying to be, do something different and unique. You know, because, I mean, there are people who would, uh, I would be willing to bet that the, the tiny little clusters that might be produced up here would go into the most spectacular wine possible. So maybe it pans out. Maybe that, that, that you know, $800 a bottle type of wine that Glenn is talking about, maybe that is an economic gold mine that I'm not aware of. But, you know, so, you know, that is part of the risk here. But if your goal is to actually grow a quantity of fruit, like what they're able to produce down here at the bottom, then yes, that is a failure. But yeah, there's, you know, this is, it's an interesting world of wine grapes because there's no other, you would never grow carrots like this because it wouldn't pay, but maybe in the world of grapes, there might be a way to make that pay off. I, I don't know. Okay, but as far as some things that we can do to try to change the conditions that we're given with, 
Um, these, these types of, of uh, uh, tube houses, that you, uh, tunnels that you see like this, um, uh, they're be used more and more in coastal California for lots of crops. I've seen it in my area a little bit now with some table grapes that we have, but primarily for the berry crops, blueberries, the cane berries do very, very well in these hoop houses. This is an example of wine grapes grown under these hoop houses, but in Michigan, where they need that extra heat that this can generate to help ensure that, that crop will ripen. So I think if you're insisting on growing grapes, vinifera grapes in that type of environment, this could be a proper investment for you to make sure that that can happen. And you can definitely extend the growing season substantially by having this type of protection. But it would not surprise me to see, even in California over time, that we may use uh, structures like this more and more. But they are quite expensive, but they, especially for the late end of the season, to ensure you can harvest things like table grapes, they can really pay off quite a bit. What I see more and more, especially in my area, where we do have a lot of sunburn risk in the hotter parts, say in Paso Robles and, and parts of Santa Barbara County, are the use of these uh, types of protective uh, shade cloths, different types of shade cloths like this. So this is an example where somebody has enough capacity at their site to produce a, a fairly modest VSP type canopy. That soil really doesn't have enough oomph to grow a larger canopy, so they can't create their own shade easily at that site. So what they've had to do now is put up this shade cloth to try to protect that fruit from burning up with the hot afternoon sun. Um, so in some ways, it's sort of an expedient solution, like putting a Band-Aid on a situation that you can't otherwise change. But I would imagine in the future, if this is too much trouble for people, they'll simply look for different ways to farm the grapes, different trellis systems, different sites that are, can produce enough vigor to create a canopy that can shade the fruit a little bit more, um, because this has to be expensive and a uh, bother over time to be farming this way. But there are more and more people using it because they do perceive that they are getting a, an improvement on their their quality from it. Um, reducing heat, we can use evaporation cooling like this in the middle of the summer by running sprinklers at a site. Um, the downside is that this requires lots of water available to be able to do this. Um, in my area, we don't have this type of water available to irrigate like this um, with sprinklers over the canopy. But in some parts of California where that water still is available, they can do this and it is beneficial to be able to reduce the heat. Um, but it's kind of an extreme uh, case anymore. And just another example of, of reducing wind. This is a, another companion vineyard planted by the, the same folks that explore that other hillside. Also a site which is experiencing very, a lot of difficulty growing those vines because of the constant battering of wind. Uh, putting up taller shade structures, I'm sorry, wind blocking structures like this. And it, the vines definitely grow better when they have this type of dense fabric to sort of lean against and protect them from the wind. And whether or not it's going to pay off in the end will be interesting to see because it requires you to put these on every row like this in order to support the, these uh, little vines here. Okay, so that's just sort of a, a kind of a brief overview of some of the type of climate type things that we want to keep in mind. Now I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about water supply factors. Um, the old adage is that wine grape ET in California is about 18 inches a year. So that's about the total amount of water that a vineyard would need to produce a crop. That includes whatever is stored in the soil from winter rainfall and the amount that we add with irrigation. Um, so some is supplied by rainfall, but not all rainfall is effective. A lot of the rainfall that falls is going to evaporate off or be used by a cover crop, something that does not go to supporting the growth of that vine. And you know, we are lucky in California in that our rainfall falls in the winter when it can then percolate into the soil. We don't lose much to evaporation as in other parts of the world. Uh, Mendoza in Argentina receives about the same amount of rainfall as central California does, but it falls in the summer. And that rain in the hot summer just evaporates very, very quickly. They don't get much benefit as far as supporting plant growth from that summer rainfall. So when the rainfall occurs is an important factor. Whatever natural precipitation doesn't make up, we need to then be able to supply by irrigation. So knowing in advance whether or not that water supply is available is a key factor to determining whether or not a projected vineyard is going to be successful. And not only is that, are we talking a total amount of water, but the other factor is we have to be able to meet the peak demand. So however much water is needed in the middle of the summer, you have to have a flow rate of water that can meet that demand because it's not much help if you have enough volume available 
for the entire year on average, but you can't meet that critical flow need in the middle of the summer when the ET is at its highest. So just to kind of give you a, a feel for what irrigation requirements may be, this is some data that I collected in the Paso Robles area over a, a number of years trying to quantify vineyard irrigation applications in that area. So each dot represents the average annual application of irrigation in the region east of Paso Robles, which we'll just sort of consider to be a sort of an average vineyard area for the drier part of California. So you can see the, the amount of rainfall that fell the winter prior, um, that's the x-axis, and then the vertical axis is how much irrigation they supplied the following calendar year. So what it shows pretty clearly is that the more rain fell, the less they irrigate, right? Pretty, pretty clear uh, relationship there. Now, what I've kind of done is extrapolate beyond that, and maybe this might be a, a relationship that exists elsewhere in California, assuming that evapotranspiration conditions are more or less the same, that we can then predict roughly how much irrigation you might need to be applying if you know how much rainfall you receive on average. So if you're in Northern California, let's say in Sonoma County, and you get somewhere between 30 or maybe up to 35 inches, you can then maybe make a very rough projection of how much water you are going to need per acre of a vineyard out there. Okay, so this is just sort of a, a starting tool, but you know each region really has its own unique characteristics, so you do need to, to study up on what your irrigation requirements are going to be for an area, and then assess whether or not your water supply, whether it's a well or a surface water supply has sufficient volume to support that acreage. And then the other uh, important factor is, can you meet the peak demand during the summer period? So again, this is the same Paso Robles data, but now just shown to you as monthly average irrigation amounts throughout the season. And with the goal here of showing you, well, first of all, it's, it's highly variable throughout the season. Early in the spring and early summer, yeah, we are irrigating, but a lot of that vine water requirement is being met by stored soil moisture from the previous winter's rainfall. It's not until we get up into August where we have our peak irrigation amounts. But that's what you need to be able to supply with your irrigation system. Okay, so you, it, again, it's not, it's not only just a total quantity of water, but being able to meet that peak flow demand to then meet that need. Okay. But now, the, those last two slides, the important thing to keep in mind, those are averages of many vineyards. There was actually 84 vineyards that went into producing those little dots. So we know in reality that even within a small area that there's a lot of variability, for example, of soil conditions. So if you have a site, for example, with a very deep soil, with a, a, a heavier soil type that stores much more water from the preceding winter's rainfall, that site's going to require far less irrigation than a very coarse soil, shallow soil that stores far less water from the previous winter uh, rainfall. So you can have a tremendous site-to-site -site variability even though you have exactly the same rainfall conditions. So those averages can only go so far to help you fine-tune what you think your, your needs are going to be. You have to do some actual digging on site to be able to really assess how much storage of water can occur there and then make a better prediction of how much water you're going to need. Then the other factor is, well, what types of vines are you going to be growing? Is your goal to grow a more thrifty vine like on the left without having a very large canopy, which is going to use less water, require less water? Or is your goal to grow a much larger vine like on the right that might produce twice the crop per acre, but with that much larger canopy, it's going to use more water and require more irrigation? So this is the other factor which you'll have to be able to predict ahead of time to understand whether or not your water availability um, is sufficient. And then to talk a bit about water quality concerns, this is actually one thing that I see ignored a lot with irrigated vineyards in my area. The people were excited to uh, design the vineyard, plant the vineyard, and once they figured out they had enough water for it, but addressing water quality concerns was often sort of ignored or wasn't addressed until problems started to appear because of poor water quality. So it's really a good thing to address and understand from the get-go to make sure you don't have problems occurring later down the road. So the important thing to keep in mind is that grapes are far more sensitive to poor water quality than are many crops. You know, a water which will grow alfalfa or irrigated pasture perfectly well will, can be a failure for grapes. 
Um, they are just far more sensitive both to total salts and things like boron um, that, that might be perfectly fine for another crop but will completely wipe out a vineyard. Um, we also have some other issues because we're using precision drip irrigation which has very small fine orifices that we're passing that water through. Clogging is a big concern so if we have uh, hardness in our water, high calcium, high, high magnesium and carbonates that can create um, what we call um, uh, lime deposits which can clog up the, those systems and it's very expensive to have to go through and fix that. Then we also have toxicities, chloride and sodium and then sodium also has some soil problems which I'll show you in a slide here. So our basic concerns with, with water related toxicities of our grapevines primarily for chlorides here this is a, tip, a standard chloride burn um, again, that's when, when that starts happening, you start losing functional leaf area and your photosynthesis is reduced. And as that increases, you can essentially lose the entire canopy from having a very high level of toxicity. Uh, boron symptoms here, a similar marginal uh, discoloration here. Um, that is much more prone to show up as a reduction in overall vegetative growth and then a reduction in the size of the, of the fruit load on those vines. So very big impact on the productivity. Sodium uh, toxicity symptoms like this are much more rare. We don't, generally don't have high levels of sodium to cause these, these types of foliar symptoms due to sodium, but they can cause lots of problems in the soil. Here. Yeah? Uh, practice, practice. So iron deficiency uh, has a, a different leaf symptom. It's more <laughs> of an overall yellowing. You get a very, very chlorotic leaf. So the blade itself, the entire blade, will be a, a much paler green to yellowish color. And then when that iron deficiency symptom gets more severe, then you get the marginal burning like you have here. Um, if this was iron deficiency, all that you see green here would be a pale yellow color. Okay, but that, good, good question. Yeah, determining based on visual symptoms alone has its limitations. So it's always good to back up any symptoms one sees like this by actual tissue testing to then determine what is the uh, problem at hand. And if you're measuring for a toxin like this, you want to measure the leaf blade because that's where these toxins are occurring. Okay. Um, the uh, overall salinity, that, which is just a, the total combination of all the things that are dissolved in the water, itself isn't necessarily toxic to a vine because you can have, that can be made up by things like calcium and magnesium, which are not necessarily toxic, but they make the water more saline and vines and many other plants do not grow well, your, the response to the plant is just to make less vegetative growth. So what this is happening here, and this is a block of planted on 5C rootstock, which is rather sensitive to salts. So under those saltier conditions, the vines just make very little growth. But then when they planted a replacement vine on 1103 Paulson, which is far more robust under the same types of salty conditions, it just grows like crazy. So it's just a really good demonstration of what is the impact of salts on the growth of vines. It just everything just grows less and you get less yield. And oftentimes if one is not doing tests of the soil or the water, this is interpreted as being a lack of nutrients. So the response is to fertilize more, which doesn't cure the problem because you still have the salts there that are, that are basically drying up the vines and not allowing them to, to uh, reach their potential. So diagnostics of soils and waters and tissues is a very important step to help understand these things. Um, when we're using groundwater, especially for irrigation, the clogging potential of that water is a really important thing to consider because you know, the drip irrigation system is a very large investment and if over time that just simply clogs up, you get a very poor uniformity of your irrigation application, a very poor performance of the vines overall and fixing that is very, very expensive. You have to go out and unclog those emitters or replace emitters. And we are increasingly using inline emitters, which you really cannot fix easily. So proper maintenance from day one of using acid injection or whatever else the lab would recommend based on your water test is going to be a key step to follow to make sure that you don't end up with a bunch of clogged emitters five years down the road and no easy way to fix that. So it's not something to ignore. One of our big challenges with poor quality irrigation water that has sodium is the effect of that sodium on the soil structure over time. 
what sodium does, it, it uh, uh, displaces the, um, the aggregates, kind of breaks apart the soil structure, and it turns what may have been a nicely structured soil that allowed water and air to move freely up and down, it turns it into a brick. Okay, it becomes very, very dense, and roots have trouble penetrating, but primarily water, instead of flowing straight downward, it tends to flow laterally through a soil like that. So when that happens on a hillside like this, the drip irrigation comes down here, and over the summer, a lot of sodium was added with that water, gradually sealed up that soil surface, and then over time, water then just flows downhill and is now irrigating this weed here while the vine is sort of suffering, you can see, uh, sort of drying up from lack of water, amongst other things, and probably all the, the high salts as well. So it's a very subtle thing, but if you are farming in the western U.S., chances are, if you're using groundwater, that may have some poor quality water, and you really have to be aware of things like sodium because it builds up over time in a soil and this will become increasingly worse. Okay. So the type of test you would do is for irrigation suitability. This is different than the test you would submit for potability. If you were to, to drink the water, there, are, there is some overlap, but irrigation suitability will address all of the concerns if you are irrigating plants with that water. And I can't um, emphasize enough that if the lab makes a clear recommendation that whatever limitations there are with that water, you have to respect that because if not, the problem will get worse over time typically as whatever nasty thing is in that water gets built up in your soil if you don't address it, whether it be by acid injection or by leaching or sometimes by choosing another water source or by blending that water with a different water source to make it less nasty for irrigation. That's very important to not ignore that. Okay, and then finally here, I'll just kind of wrap up with more of a focus on soil factors and kind of my emphasis with this is to help people avoid disasters when they plant vineyards. The types of things that we need to be aware of well beforehand because they're very difficult to fix afterwards. So address kind of just the basic overall tilth, you know, how, how physically suitable is a site for growing a plant period. Uh, look at physical limitations, poor drainage and barriers to whether it be root penetration or water movement. Uh, chemical limitations, that's primarily lime in the soil or high magnesium soils, mostly the things that we deal with. Um, fertility, mostly it's excess is our problem with grapes because we don't want things to grow too much. And variability of soils, that's always a challenge. There are some locations in the world, if you go out to Davis, you can walk 500 yards, the soil's almost exactly the same in all directions. Um, you come to the coastal areas, you walk 10 feet, and the soil is almost fully different from where you were at. So the, uh, un understanding that variability is a key thing to be able to, des to design that vineyard and determine how to set up your vineyard. And I, I hope this slide drives home the point that you have to dig in order to understand what is going on at a site. This layer here on top is about four feet deep. So if you go out there with your shovel and you're eager to plant your vineyard, you sort of poke around the first foot or two, it looks really good. You say, wow, I've got some nice topsoil and here's some nice crumbly soil here with good drainage. Let's go ahead and plant. But if you don't take the backhoe out and get down to four feet and see that you've got this surprise here, then you would never know. And maybe over time you might realize that this layer is impeding, well, it's clearly going to impede the movement of roots, but maybe it's impeding water Maybe it's doing other things that will create problems over time. If this doesn't allow water to move readily downward and you're flushing salty water that you're leaching through your root zone, it's all going to accumulate here and slowly uh, poison your vines. So that's something we want. We want to know ahead of time where these little spots are at. Maybe somewhere in the vineyard this soil depth might only be two feet deep. You want to know that before you think you're having a uniform site throughout. Um, and we should, we should also just address the basic issue of how farmable are sites. This is a, an example. Um, uh, this is actually a farm in Argentina where a person I think was just, I'm not sure, very optimistic or very unrealistic perhaps as far as how easy this would be to farm. If you're in the back, maybe it's hard to see, but there are boulders about the size of this podium scattered throughout that soil. And that's basically what it is, just large boulders. Um, so maybe it imparts some sort of special terroir or something, but this is a site you can't farm this mechanically, even to the point of using a tractor through here. That'd be very difficult to drive through a site like that. So you really have to resort to farming that by hand. 
which maybe I could understand if this was producing some top quality um, uh, wine grape, but this is actually a raisin vineyard in Argentina. So I think it's just somebody who just wanted to prove that something could be farmed, and this is what they ended up with. Um, another concern, topography. In some parts of the state, like here up north, there are limitations on slopes that you can farm. Other parts of the world were a little more liberal still with that, figuring if you can farm it, if you can drive up and down it, you're okay. But you run into problems like this of having severe erosion at sites. So just be cognizant of that. That's a limitation for many sites. Um, drainage, shallow bedrock. This was a site they did not realize that two feet below the surface there's a layer of, of basalt that stops the movement of water. So this is actually in India during the, the monsoon season. They took me out. They wanted to dig a soil pit so I could take a look at their roots, and this is what happens. This is, is the problem because there is no drainage. And this was made even worse because the farmer wanted to have a level field, so they, they uh, cut off all the topsoil to level the site, not realizing that in this corner of the field, they just made the soil far too shallow. So again, digging with a backhoe would have helped address that. Um, another example of poor drainage, this is a caused by a clay lens, which is probably about 10 or 15 feet below the surface. You could never, unfortunately, find that with some casual digging. But that clay lens prevents downward movement of water and creates what we call a perched water table. Salty water accumulates on that clay lens, and then there's a big circle of dead vines because there's no drainage in that area. Go 20 feet beyond that, the vines look perfect because they have drainage. It's just over this clay lens where things aren't growing. Uh, related to that would be a hard pan like this. This is much shallower. This is by about 18 inches deep right here to about oh, uh, 30 inches here. Um, these can form naturally, but they can also form by cultivation. The use of plows over many years at a site will form these hard pans. And if they're not addressed by deep tillage prior to developing a site, if they exist, you will then have problems with water penetration. And that's what's going on here. We dug a hole under the drip emitter to see what happened to the irrigation water and it just stayed right there, would not, not move downward. So that creates uh, problems here. Uh, this is an example of a clay layer, very, very dense, impermeable clay layer that exists at about two feet below the ground surface, um, but only in certain areas. And where that clay layer exists, the vines die, and they basically suffocate because they're sitting in standing water during the summer when they can't handle that lack of drainage. Now this is, a, this is not California, this is a, a picture in, in Peru uh, in an area that receives maybe about one inch of rainfall a year and you would never believe that the problem affecting vineyards like this, the vines are dying, they're drowning in water. A little hard to understand why, which is why they've had some problems here, but what's going on there is a difference in soil texture. When you have a very fine textured soil sitting on a much coarser textured soil layer with a very distinct interface, that causes weird things to happen with water movement. So this is the fine textured layer here, a clear interface with then a pure sand down below. So water penetrates great through this upper layer, but once it hits that interface, water does not want to pass through that interface. It wants to move sideways through the finer textured layer. And it's only when this is all saturated with water will water then be pushed downward into the coarse sand. So that creates these zones of saturation, which are really bad for the roots there. It's a difficult problem to address after planting the vineyard. And these occur at about three feet deep, so it's not an easy thing for them to do once the vines are in place. But that's, we can address that far more readily if we do that before planting. Uh, this is an example of a site which should have been used for growing sorghum or corn, but instead they planted grapes here. Um, we never want to see a vineyard like this where we cannot see any speck of sun that comes down through that canopy. Uh, this, there was absolutely no air circulation, no light penetration. It was a powdery mildew disaster, of course, so it was a complete loss. This is an overhead trellis system, so it is designed to have a lot of foliage over it, but not 100% coverage. Uh, lime chlorosis. Um, High line strips in our soils often occur in these sort of longitudinal strips throughout an area. They can be kind of hard to find unless you are looking at the growth of a previous crop out there 
or unless you can see a color difference in the soil. The easiest way to find them is to plant grapes on them, and then the lime affected grapes show up beautifully. And this is, this is the width of it, then it goes along many rows on both the left and the right from that, along that, that strip corresponding to that geologic formation under there. Yeah. So your, your, is your question to lime soils or to clay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the examples I was showing with the problems uh, occurring to vineyards with the poor drainage, those were such severe problems that basically any vine would suffer very badly. As far as are there rootstock, there are some rootstocks that might handle wet conditions better, but mostly that's winter wet conditions. When you have saturated soils in the summer, um, there's, there's not too many grapes that will do well under those conditions at all. But those are not conditions I tend to deal with in dry California, so we'd have to look maybe elsewhere for expertise on, on, on that. We, we can talk about that more. I know I'm running a bit short on time, right? But, uh, I'm very close, Carmen. Yeah. So let me skip. I think I'm just down to a couple slides here. Just want to talk about variability. Um, this is a, an example of how highly variable soils can be in short distances. There's two soil pits here. One right up the hill here, and then one here. This is the soil pit up the top of the hill. But you can just see from the color difference how clearly there are different things going on in these soils, even over very short distances. So ideally, when we set up our blocks, we want to separate out these conditions. Um, another more severe example, this is a vineyard that was planted, maybe ignoring the different soil conditions to its detriment. Uh, what we have is a vineyard block that's on a little bit of a hill up here and then goes down to the flat spot down at the bottom. Up on the hilltop here, the shoots are probably about two and a half, three feet long, and that's enabled because the soil is, is fairly rocky, has a lot of porosity, and is well drained. Down at the bottom here, this is what the soil looks like. It's, it's, like, it's a brick, very heavy, no drainage, no air uh, movement, and the vines on the same day have, uh, they're about four inches long in their shoots. So huge impact on the ability of the vines to grow based on these differences in the two soil conditions, even though everything else is the same at the sites. So this is, again, the, under, the importance to understand these differences and ideally separate out the less desirable sites. And then my final slide here, there are some limitations to changing soils. We can harvest rocks like this with this big machine. We can use huge implements to break up and you know, fracture soils to maybe make them be better growing conditions. We can add all sorts of chemicals to the soils, but we're dealing with large volumes, large areas. You know, there are some sites which used to may, maybe should just say, this is not a good place to grow grapes and find a more suitable site. So just re realize that there are some limit limitations to what we can change at a site. All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, so inches, it's, it's a depth over the entire field. So if you wanted to now convert that to gallons, you have to figure out how many gallons are in an acre foot, for example. That's 326,000 gallons. And then if you knew how many vines per acre, let's say there's 1,000 vines per acre, then that's 326 gallons per vine per year. It would be a, it's, 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 yeah, so we, we just use what we call a unit depth of water. Think of, it's sort of like rainfall. If, if irrigation was rainfall, if you're spreading it out evenly, we would say 12 inches of irrigation would be like applying 12 inches of rainfall to the entire area. Yeah, Any other yeah real quick, just uh, the clay on top of the sand, mm -hmm. the one picture you showed, how would you mitigate that if you caught it before you planted it? Well, if it was a, a layer that was deep enough to reach with a tillage implement, destroying that, mixing that up would have been the ideal thing to do. Now, the situation they have now is that they've planted. They cannot do that. So now you need to adjust your irrigation so you're not pushing water down to that level. So instead of having one single drip line, have multiple drip lines. So instead of irrigating in a narrow width but deeply, you want to go widely but shallowly. 
That's really the only thing they can do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if, if you're just fracturing it and not mixing, then yes, that is often what happens. Um, so that's, you saw the, the last slide, how big that tractor with that implement was, and that big thing on the back was designed to mix, aid in mixing. So the, there's different types, what we call a slip plow is what mixes layers. So that type, mixing layers requires a huge amount of horsepower. That's a lot of work to do that. 